Hi everyone, this is Real World Audio and uh, we are continuing our Jean Hiraga a loudspeaker analysis, his uh, uh, 604 drivers that he's using, the Atec 604 drivers in a bass reflex cabinet. So now let's look at how does he use them. So there's the reference here at the Six Moons website that uh, basically the cabinet is built of 30 millimeter thick beach uh, butcher block cabinet and uh, inside it uses uh, bitumen and fat liners so there is like quite a bit of uh, heavy dampening and light dampening as well and the cross brace so there is um, that typical uh, bracing inside uh, that I mentioned at my last episode plus that bitumen lining that's something new and that's kind of like taking it towards the von Schweikert road and von Schweikert is the one who started experimenting with something like the bitumen and then he went to more extremes that and, uh, and for dampening um, I am not that big of a fan of this uh, huge internal dampening because you cannot uh, get rid of energy in that way even if you use bitumen you are going to modify the sound signature and it uh, yes you are going to drop resonances down by many many dbs when you use that sort of dampening However, how bitumen behaves and those materials which achieve this extreme amount of dampening is they are going to create uh, non-harmonic additions to your signal. So your loudspeaker will have a very quiet extra voice added to it which doesn't work with the music. So it's going to play something out of tune very quietly and uh, this thing is something very subtle but if you have a good hearing it will bother you to know and after a while when you start picking on it for those people who don't have a good hearing or your hearing is not trained yet you will not realize it in the beginning but subconsciously uh, after a while you will start picking on it and you will develop the desire to want something more and look for other loudspeakers. You don't know why because you think it sounds perfect but something is just not right and that something is that uh, echo of those uh, low frequency smear distortions that are added by these uh, dampening methods which uh, which delay uh, the resonances and, and just transfer it to uh, frequencies which have no uh, no continuity with your music signal because when you have your cabinet like here like this uh, beach cabinet if it is resonating with the music then uh, those cabinet resonances will amplify certain notes so when you read loudspeaker reviews it's like certain notes of the piano will sound as if the pianist is uh, striking those harder than the other keys and uh, if you built your cabinet tuned to the western musical scale then it won't be so bothersome because those resonant peaks will be at the exact place where a music note occurs but if you are using a golden ratio for your cabinets these resonant frequencies will occur at ranges which do not correspond to the music and then you will hear the cabinet no matter what so basically your pianist is playing something and at those frequencies which correspond to those uh, golden ratio uh, length and, and the, the upper harmonics of those, they will contaminate your music. So if you ever listen to music written in a golden ratio musical scale, 
Yes, that is music, but it sounds like some aliens coming from an alien planet making music. So when your cabinet is designed with golden ratio, then it will add an alien uh, sound to your music because there is a band of aliens uh, following no matter what you play. And that's why many companies, they, they came up with the idea to brace the heck out of your loudspeaker and include all sorts of internal dampening, go to the extremes, so that those aliens are quieted down by a couple of dB. Oh yes, they are quieted down, but there's also this smear added to the music that comes from taking the resonances to low frequencies. And uh, the better the bass department of your loudspeaker is, the more bothersome these, uh, these uh, smears can become for you. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to talk about? Oops, there's too much, too much. Let's just go back here. Uh, so, going back here, uh, he is using, where does he say, uh, he's using a slot port, a strategic tuning slots and the down firing port that is slot loaded into the integral plinth. What on earth does that mean? So when you look at the cabinet, let's just zoom into them. So you see that at the base of the cabinet, you see an opening and that's a slot. That's the opening of the slot port. When we look at another image from another angle, you see from the back and the sides, you can see the slot running all over at the base. So basically, how this cabinet looks like on the inside is that there are feet here, uh, like one, two, three, four, maybe four feet on the inside, and, and the bottom is, is like a, a slot opening. So there's in, in the center, there might be a hole there and the air can come through that hole and squeeze through between the bottom of the cabinet and this extra plinth, extra board that's placed. So basically this is the internal bottom and that's that thing that you see on, on the basement and between the two, that's where the air comes out and that gives the tuning of the loudspeaker and the air comes through in a circle right there and it squeezed through these slots in an omnidirectional fashion. So basically the base breathes out and breathes in and it breathes naturally and that's just perfect because basically the low frequencies are always created as omnidirectional sound waves and this is a stroke of genius from Jean Hiraga that he, he, he built his uh, cabinet this way, that it uses a slot port for the base. And another good thing that when you use a slot port, then the airflow is much more uh, linear, there's much less turbulences compared to having just that, that tube that most people do, that they stick up a tube at the back or the butt of the loudspeaker and it's just as Paul McGowan is saying he says that the speaker farts through the port and uh, that's kind of a very descriptive way of uh, telling it but uh, it's true because uh, if you are pushing the loudspeaker too much then you can hear the port talking more and more so Nelly told me that when I played the Mirage loud and she said oh I can hear the port doing its job right there and if you have a slot port that phenomenon is not happening so those people who do not like ports actually they do not like those round little holes at the back of the speakers or the front of the speakers um let's see let's see what else do we have here uh, da, da, da. So external crossover provides impedance and frequency domain linearization and the 30-60 Hz saddle response peaks from the bus reflex alignment sit at 60 ohms rather than above 100 as they would without compensation. So what on earth is he talking about? Does anyone understand it? 
Okay, let, let's make this clear for everyone. That's, so for that, I, I'm going to show my loudspeaker's uh, measurements for uh, my uh, 515 woofer, which is the same motor mechanism basically as that used for the 605 here. So when I have measured the electrical response of the base driver, this is inside the cabinet. This is what I have found. This is the phase response, electrical phase, and that's the impedance. So as you see, when we go impedance uh, up to about, let's say, 60 hertz, the impedance is really benign, and it stays like under 20 ohms, between like, uh, it's 16 ohms, around 150 hertz, and, and it starts going higher as we increase in frequency, but I'm not really bothered by that because this is already the region where I'm, my crossover is already uh, kicking in. And also, when you go higher in frequency, every kind of amplifier can easily drive that, so that's never an issue. Uh, the issue of uh, high impedance is at the lower frequencies, for tube amplifiers, it can become an issue if you have a poor output transformer and that poor transformer doesn't have the inductance to handle that high output impedance for those low frequencies. If you ha have an excellent output transformer, then that's not an issue for you really because that's, that's happening around uh, 50 hertz or so, 40 hertz and uh, we are good. But if you have a, a solid state amplifier, this high impedance peak is going to give you hell, like really, really bad uh, situation because it means that your amp is unable to dump current at your loudspeaker. So basically it's kind of like a runner who is losing the ground from under his feet. And that's why I would say uh, solid state amps can have problems with, uh, with many loudspeakers, especially when you have very efficient, very sensitive loudspeakers, because they, they do not do this uh, saddle very well. They, they, they can't take that hike. And, and as you see here, we have 90 ohms, we have 100 ohms right there, and it starts climbing. I think it goes up to 140 ohms. So the exact uh, top of that peak and where that peak is frequency-wise depends on your cabinet size and the tuning of your port. So this peak can move a little bit from here to there. And uh, in my case, just like as in Hiraga's case, it's between like 60 Hertz and uh, 35 Hertz uh, that we have this big saddle. And, and what he was saying is that he added an extra uh, impedance adjustment network to, your cro to his crossover. So he cut down the peak from being this high to just climbing up to 60 ohms. And that's a really big change if we are talking about solid state amplifiers and, and many tube amps like that a lot. And what you end up with is a, is a, a tighter bass response. So it, it, you will feel as if it's more dampened. Or another way of uh, telling it is like uh, the level of the bass will be louder compared to the rest of the spectrum. So I've been experimenting with techniques like that. Uh, the simplest of that is a Zobel network that you use on a full range driver. And yes, the effect is always uh, having more bass for your system. But, and, and in the beginning, the first few days, you will feel that that's an excellent addition, but then you will realize that this extra base comes at a very dear cost, and that dear cost is your mid-range. Uh, all these uh, equalization tricks are taking out the musicality of your loudspeaker. 
So eventually when you read this review, the reviewer, he is uh, really commenting that these loudspeakers are extra musical and they have that flesh and blood sound. However, uh, my opinion is that if we do not use that impedance adjustment network, its musicality would be even much higher than what we get, especially if we do not do that internal dampening. But I think uh, Monsieur Hiraga uh, did these adjustments because uh, this makes uh, a, a much wider appeal for these loudspeakers. So instead of just being specialized for uh, vacuum tube amplifiers, now suddenly they are happy driving uh, solid state, be, be driven by solid state amps as well. And, uh, and they can deliver more of a show uh, than without these changes. And um, for all of you, it is something to think about that when you are thinking about loudspeakers, there are two extremes. There is the extreme of musicality, when you can get in touch with the humans playing behind the instruments. And you feel that you are part of the music flow. It's almost like your system is channeling the composer for you. Uh, it, it can be really, really spooky. So if you are a musician and your, or, or even if you are not, but your goal is to absorb music, especially classical music, then this way, this road is the ultimate solution for you. When you are starting to go towards uh, doing uh, extra dampening on your loudspeaker, doing impedance, uh, EQing, then you are going towards more of a show. And uh, more people will upload to it, it will get a wider appeal, but you will no longer be able to connect to music that deep level. You will not be in touch of the composer anymore. And, uh, and it will also equalize not just the frequency response, but the material you are playing back through your system. So if you are playing uh, better quality or lower quality recordings, uh, they will be much closer to each other. And if you let your loudspeaker run freely, without these limitations, without these corrective measures, then you will find a, a much bigger contrast between those music that you feed your system with. So I hope uh, this helps a little bit uh, for everyone what to look for in a loudspeaker, uh, how to, what to expect from a loudspeaker based on its design. And, and I would say that these loudspeakers are truly landmarks of, the, of our current uh, loudspeaker technology. And uh, it's something to ponder upon. And at the next episode, I will introduce you how I made my loudspeakers, what are those things which are similar to Jean Hiraga's. Incidentally, uh, when I developed mine, I have not seen this design from Jean Hiraga. And uh, after I built it like a couple of months ago, then I found it and I was just astounded that uh, uh, we, we, we just ended up with so many of the parameters uh, being virtually identical. So he also chose like a similar cabinet dimension, similar cabinet volume. Uh, the positioning of the driver is the same and he also uses slot port. My slot port is a little bit different, but both of them are slot ports. Uh, so thank you for tuning in. Please like and subscribe. Bye bye.